I'm Stacey Stender. I'm the chair of the Coordinating Committee of Scientific Activities. And today we have can I see if I grab that? eight presentations, one from Ethiopia, two from Ukraine, one from Swaziland, one from Russian Federation, two from South Africa, and one from the UK. So we have great diversity. And uh, at the end of the session, we are going to give, uh, we're going to award the Young Investigator Prize. Okay, great. So I'll hand, hand over to my co-chair. So hi, I'm Rajitha Bhavaraju. I'm from um, the Global TB Institute at Rutgers University in the United States. Um, I'm very excited that we're doing this um, for the first time. So again, we have a nice set of diversity and we'd like to sort of keep to time. So what we'll do is um, we'll go through the, present the presenters um, in the order that's actually in the program. So we'll keep you on your toes. The presentation will pop up and you'll know that it's your turn. But again, it's, it's what's in the printed program. Um, with the exception of the presenter by Mr. Omar, that's actually at the end. Um, and then um, we'll have you present, um, if you can present in less than 10 minutes and we have time for a couple of questions, we can go ahead and do that. Um, and then we just ask that you ask your questions at the microphone so that um, everybody can hear. If you do your presentation in 10 minutes, we may not have time for questions. We can try to reserve those um, to the end, okay? Okay, but I was just been informed that we need to do the award now for the photographers here and, and the award organizers. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, inform you all. So it's a, a highlight of the conference to be able to celebrate and recognize individuals who have made an outstanding contribution to TB control and lung health. Today we are awarding the Union Young Investigator Prize that acknowledges a researcher for work in lung health published in the past five years when the person is 35 years of age or younger. Today we are awarding Dr. Ru Rain Hubin is an infectious disease epidemiologist and associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. His research focuses on using mathematical modeling techniques to inform TB policy in low and middle income countries and understand the natural history of TB with a particular interest in latent TB infection and structural drivers of TB. In the last three years, Rain has successfully led the development of TIME, a user-friendly TB modeling tool that does not just address operational research questions for NTPs, but also has accessible user interface that has built local analytic capacity in over 10 countries thus far. Please join me to welcome Dr. Hubin to the stage to receive the Union Young Investigator Prize. That's excellent, and I'm glad we got this opportunity to have that um, award presented here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. As each presenter comes up, um, please um, announce, your, introduce yourself, and let us know which institution you come from and the country from which you come. So, uh, Alliance for Public Health Ukraine, and I confirm that I don't have uh, any conflict of, of interest. And um, uh, dear colleagues, let me uh, present our project, MDR-TB Patient Supported Outpatient Stage of Treatment in Ukraine. A few words about Ukraine. Uh, this is a quite big country, not so such big as Russia, but quite big, uh, located in Eastern Europe. Our territory is uh, 600, more than 600,000 square kilometers, and population is 44.5 million people and country consists of 27 regions, so we name them oblasts. Uh, Ukraine is in the list of uh, 30 high, TB burden high MDR TB burden countries in the world. We were in previous WHO list of high MDR TB burden countries, and we are in the present revised list. Uh, estimated MDR TB burden for 2014 was uh, uh, about 500 5,200 uh, among new cases and 7,800 among retreated cases. And uh, only 16% of these cases were laboratory confirmed. At the same time, we have the lowest treatment results in European region and Central Asia. Uh, we have low results for all types of uh, TB cases, but especially low 
for MDRTB cases, you can see for 2012, it was only 34% of successful treatment. And uh, this can be partly explained um, by uh, uh, the high rate of patients that were lost to follow up. You can see that among MDRTB cases, about 15% uh, were lost to follow up in 2012. Here you can see MDR-TB cascade for Ukraine for 2012. Why 2012? Because this is the year before our project started. So we uh, provide um, baseline data. You can see that only 80% of uh, all of estimate uh, of confirmed uh, laboratory confirmed MDR-TB cases were enrolled on treatment, and only 34 among these 80% were successfully treated. Uh, so in 2013, we started a project uh, within the Global Fund grant on MDR-TB patient support at outpatient state of treatment to improve our results. Uh, this project is implemented through Ukrainian Red Cross Society uh, because this is only organization that is represented in all regions of Ukraine and they have wide network of patronage nurses. And also they can hire nurses of TB facilities and nurses of uh, primary health care facilities for those remote uh, regions, remote villages uh, where they are not present. The uh, project uh, covers all regions of Ukraine except non-government control areas, Crimea and Donbass. And uh, since we didn't have enough funding for our um, project, it was decided to provide support only for those patients who are treated for global um, with second-line TB drugs procured uh, for Global Fund funding. In 2013, it was about 10% uh, of such patients. All others were covered for, uh, from um, state budget. So there were no uh, another... Um, uh, another selection criteria. We did not take into account social status or comorbidities or harmful habits. So what services uh, were provided? Uh, first of all, it was DOT. Our nurses visited uh, patients every day or six times per week because it's allowed by our uh, clinical protocol and gave them uh, drugs. They also provided psychological support when needed. Of course, they are not uh, professional psychologists, but to talk with the patient, to listen to the patient, sometimes it's enough. And also, they ask the patient uh, about side effects, symptoms, and if needed, they refer them to TB hospitals. And for those patients who were adhered to treatment, they provided, provided food kits. And here you can see uh, our treatment results. We received these results in May 2016 because this is results for cohort 2013. This is not uh, operational result, this is only cohort analysis which we report to Global Fund as well. Uh, so you can see, um, to be objective, uh, we um, assessed, we compare the results only for patients treated for Global Fund with drugs procured for Global Fund funding. Uh, here are two, co two cohorts, one cohort that were on support and another cohort, uh, 511 patients that were not on support because our project didn't start simultaneously in all regions. We started from six regions and then uh, step by step extended to all parts of Ukraine. And uh, you can see that treatment success among patients who were supported is about 86% uh, in comparison with the, those who were not supported with red column, 44.4%. Uh, uh, loss to follow up in patients who were supported decreased by 3%. And interesting to compare with those who were not supported, more than 18% were lost to follow up. And also interesting result to treatment failed and died. Treatment failed uh, about two times less than in cohorts that were not supported. And um, uh, fatal, fatal cases rate is uh, about 10 times less than in those patients who were not supported. 
And last but not least, uh, conditions for program implementation. From the first beginning, we had strong political will, since this is not fun, uh, budget state funding, <laughs> this is global fund funding, so we had green light, uh, for all our, green light for all our initiatives from the early beginning. Also, we had adequate funding, about $520 per one patient per year. This is a little bit expensive for our country, but um, if we compare with the cost for hospitalization, we understand that this is much more cheaper. And uh, also we had professional designs and developed program. We uh, conducted many trainings for all um, staff, for all project staff, starting from patronage nurses, patronage managers, program managers, monitoring and evaluation team, and so on. So, and this is a good evidence uh, for us to advocate for uh, providing treatment support for our patients from uh, budget funding when uh, Global Fund will, let us, will leave us. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenia. Really um, impressive results um, from, from what you've shown. Are there any uh, questions? I'll ask one while you get to the mic. What's the standard of care that with, with regards to the non-intervention with the nursing, well, how much interaction, you said six times a week they see the patients in the sometimes pa Sometimes patients were visited every day, sometimes six times per week. Uh, it depended from the uh, doctor's administration. We did not interfere in doctor's uh, administrations. Okay. Schemes that was prescribed uh, was given to the patient. But did you, so how, for the pa patients not in the global fund sites, how often are is, is there any difference? So you're saying it's the same in terms of the medical medical requirements? Uh, yes, we have. Um, uh, we did not analyze those patients who don't ref um, uh, who receive uh, treatment for budget uh, state for budget state, um, state. yes okay. state uh, because uh, we in 2013 we had different schemes for patients for uh, treated for global fund funding and for budget for state budget and also. Um, we should understand that uh, drug quality are different for procured for global fund. And so to exclude other, uh, so to uh, exclude other influences, other impact of other sure. factors, okay. we compared only GAF patient. To be brief, we named them MGRTB GAF patient. Got it. Thank you. Uh, my question was that you presented like uh, this treatment support has different components. Uh, like psychological one, but also like the food package that you mentioned. Um, so I just wanted to know if you have any idea of, of all the different components that were used for this uh, patient treatment support, which was the one more successful, do you think? Uh, of course, I think DOT. Uh, you mean uh, which of the components was the most crucial? Yeah, for, or do you think it has to be all together or you don't? Of course, DOT is the most important DOT provision. Of course, when we can to um, provide food kits, it would be great for patients. In 2013, we provided very good food of uh, food kits. Uh, into now, uh, we have social economic crisis and our currency uh, depressed three times. Our food kits are a little bit poor, but we still provide them. Of course, crucial is uh, DOT, visit patient every day. Uh, but uh, we should understand that psychological support to talk to patient, to answer his question, and uh, side effects control from the side of nurse it doesn't cost uh, something, so this is like, we don't pay for this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to Swaziland, M. Verdekia, to talk about short course. I'm sorry, I don't know, have your first name listed here. Maria. Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to describe the model of care that we as MSF, together with the National TB Control Program uh, in Swaziland, have been implementing oh, sorry, to treat uh, MDR, uh, DR TB patients. So this is Swaziland, it's a very small country, and it has a very high HIV prevalence, and also TB incidence, very high TB incidence. It's also characterized by an extremely high, sorry, <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, by extremely high HIV-TB co-infection of uh, 82%. 
So MSF has been supporting the um, MOH in treating the RTB in Swaziland since 2011. And um, uh, we started, like everybody else, treating the MDR uh, TB with a 20-month uh, regimen. And uh, here I have the, the first three years uh, cohort um, uh, outcomes. Um, I just want to point out the 75% success rate. In 2014, we started implementing uh, an observational study uh, to treat MDRTB patient uh, with a, a short course regimen. So this was a prospective single arm cohort study, and the sample size was 120 HIV positive patients, although we recruited also HIV negative. The main study objectives are to describe eff uh, effectiveness by measuring outcomes at the end of treatment, but also uh, relapse rate after one year after completion of treatment. So we follow up the patients for one year after they complete the treatment. We also observe safety very closely by monitoring all the um, adverse events throughout the whole treatment duration. Inclusion criteria, who, who do we include in the studies? Just the MDR-TB, so we exclude any other type of uh, resistance. We also exclude any patients that have any other contraindications to the drugs or um, that have uh, uh, severe renal insufficiency or cardiac problems. This is our cohort overall, uh, 129 uh, patients were recruited. I'm happy to say that in October we actually finished the recruitment uh, and we achieved the 120 HIV positive uh, patients, so we should have uh, uh, final results uh, within two years because they have to finish treatment and the follow-up. So these are just very preliminary results. We have uh, among the HIV sub-analysis 75% uh, success uh, rate. I would like to point out the loss to follow-up, which is quite extraordinary. We, one patient lost to follow-up, uh, which makes 1.6% among the HIV positive. So I'm here to describe the model of care. I just want to clarify that this model of care is not just for the, for the short core regimen, but it's, it's, we, we use this model of care to treat all of the all of the, um, the RTB patients. So we have two multidisciplinary teams. One is based at the facility uh, level, and one is an outreach team that goes to the patient's homes. <coughs> So I wanted to give you a perspective from the patient. The patient comes to the clinic and everybody there is uh, screened for TB. So once the patient is, uh, um, has a gene expert done and is found to be uh, rifampicin resistant, a nurse tells the patient about MDR-TB and what it means to have this disease. At this point, the nurse performs ECG or diometry and plans for a chest X-ray. The doctor performs a routine uh, visit for MDR-TB patients. And now is the time for adherence officer to talk with the patient and to explain everything about the RTB. And he explains uh, what it means to have it. He explains uh, how important it is to adhere to the treatment and also the importance of, of having a family support uh, for, uh, for the patient. The adherence officer also explains the role of the treatment supporter. That could be somebody in the family or uh, outside of the family. And generally, the support package that MSF uh, provides. So we provide um, uh, monthly home visits, but also a comprehensive support cap, uh, package that comprises of transport fees for the patient and the treatment supporter, food vouchers for the patient and the family, and um, the treatment supporter also receives incentives or a stipend, depending if he's uh, part of the family or uh, somebody external. Now is the time for a psychosocial supervisor to assess the readiness of this patient to start treatment, to really understand if he has this family support, what are his real circumstances, and are there any barriers that will prevent this patient from uh, completing treatment? So does he have any cultural or, um, or um, religious beliefs that would prevent him? Or uh, does he have history of uh, drug abuse, alcohol, or does he have history of anxiety, um, depression, all these kinds of things that can, have, um, that can prevent the patients from completing treatment. At this point, the patient is sent home, but treatment has not started yet. Very, as soon as possible, home visits follow, and the home piece, a visit is done by the outreach, outreach team, uh, and it comprises of a mobile counselor, a nurse, and infection control uh, officer. 
So they meet the whole family and the treatment supporter, if this person has been identified, and give the same information as the adherence officer has given on day one, using actually the same flip charts and the same things. They perform uh, contact screening and uh, um, um, HIV testing for the whole family, if they want, and they train the treatment supporter. So he understands these roles throughout the whole duration of the treatment. At this point, the appointment is scheduled for initiation as soon as possible. We, we don't want to waste time now. The patient needs to start treatment. So, initiation day, the adherence officer assesses his readiness in the sense that he tries to understand how much of the information that's been given to the patient he has uh, uh, retained and eventually repeats. The medical doctor assesses the, the nutrition status and interprets the baseline test results. Also plans for any other um, comorbidity that my patient might have. And then the medical doctor finally initiates the patient on treatment and the, supporters, um, sorry, the treatment supporter signs the contract. So here the treatment supporters really commit himself to come to the clinic for any follow-up uh, visit and to, um, and to keep the dot book, so to observe the patient taking the drugs. After this, we have two, uh, after two weeks since initiation, there is the first follow-up visit and then monthly afterwards. So this is a patient-centered approach, and during the intensive phase, uh, patients need uh, daily injections. So we try really to tailor this around the circumstances of the patient. So if the patient lives near the clinic and is able to come, he will come every day. If he cannot come because uh, he's uh, not very mobile, then an MSF, clinic, um, an MSF nurse will go to the home of the patient. If a patient lives very far away, then we might make arrangements uh, with a clinic nearby the patient's residence so that the patient can go to this clinic to receive his injections. And we will call the clinic and monitor that actually the patient does receive the injections. The mobile counselor will perform monthly home visits and he will do a pill count then once a month and, and will check the treatment supporter um, dot book. And he will generally, generally check how the patient is doing and if there's something that he needs to report to the medical team. Patients with adherence problems receive uh, um, these home visits uh, twice a month. We also provide halfway houses. So if there are patients that have a particular psychosocial um, um, issues or, uh, for example, if they've been evicted from, from their homes because they've got MDRTB, we've had few cases like that, then we provide these homes where the patient can stay and um, an MSF treatment supporter will manage these homes and also will perform a DOT. So the patients also organize monthly support book, book uh, groups that we facilitate. They also choose the topics of these uh, support groups. So we truly believe that uh, we cannot uh, uh, divide, extrapolate the treatment and the model of care. So we advocate uh, that the patient-centered approach to treat the RTB patients is based on these two pillars, effective drugs and safe drugs, and a support package of care as main facilitator to achieve good outcomes. Oh, sorry. Uh, with this, I would like to thank all the teams of physicians, nurses, cancer, and psychosocial support working in uh, the project in Swaziland, the Swazi National TB Control Program, and the patients. Thank you. Great, thank you. Excellent presentation. Any questions or comments from the audience? I, I just had one question. Do you routinely do audiometry for your patients before starting treatment? And is that something the nurse also does? Yes, we've been okay. training nurses to do audio. Okay, so the nurse is a, a multi-skilled person. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, here we have a question. Great. Please um, introduce yourself. Uh, Tom from UCL. Um, what does the infection control officer do in the household? Yes, actually, I was expecting that question because I didn't elaborate on all the job description. So the infection control checks uh, that uh, there, there are... We, we, we sometimes might make minor uh, improvement to the, to the homes if we believe that they would uh, um, help in controlling the infection. So if there's the need to open a window, we might do that, or maybe just give some advices to determine, to tell the patient maybe not to sleep with uh, uh, children, to try to see how we can help in that sense to control the, uh, the infection. Great. Okay, thank you. Our next presenter is Anna Tyshevek, if I said that correctly, presenting again from Ukraine. 
Dear colleagues, I am Anna Tushkevich from uh, the School of Public Health of National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, and I'm very honored to be here today and to be able to present our results from the small operational study devoted to the delays in treatment initiation from healthcare perspective in Ukraine. This study was supported by US Agency for International Development and implemented by students and supervisors from the School of Public Health. Our study was triggered by several facts. As Eugenia previously mentioned, Ukraine is for a long time in the list of countries with a heavy MDR burden and the treatment success among all cases is under 70%. And, uh, around more than half of their recurrent cases are MDRGB. And for no, no doubt, the treatment success is jeopardized by the treatment delays. So in our research, we decided to focus on what is actually the average duration of TB treatment initiation in Ukraine and what are the correlating factors. The study had a mixed design the qualitative and quantitative part. The quantitative part was focusing on the analysis of all the cases first time diagnosed in 2014 on the data from National Electronic TB Registry. And qualitative uh, part was based on the interviews with healthcare providers aiming to reveal barriers in timely uh, treatment initiation. Uh, so what is actually worth mentioning that in Ukraine treatment can only be started after the confirmation of diagnosis at the specialized facility and the treatment initiation also starts in sp the specialized TB facility. And in this graph we can see uh, that the mean duration between the person seeking care, of course, first time at the first level healthcare facility, and the initiation of treatment is 23 days on average in Ukraine. And you can also see the median values in red lines. And what raises a big concern is the big uh, regional deviation. We see the deviation from 9 to 40 days in different regions of Ukraine. Uh, this is raised with these concerns because the national protocols are in, in place. So the, the, this duration has to be somehow similar. And what is also interesting that this regional uh, differences, they don't correspond to the GB burden in the region. So there are some regions with very high burden and a short duration and regions with a low burden but very long duration of GB treatment initiation. On this graph, we can see the main uh, events on the, on the way to the treatment. What we see in green lines is the duration between the self-reported first-time display of symptoms and the person seeking care at the first level facility. This gives us inspiration on the TB awareness in the region and of the accessibility of the first level care in the region. And this varies from, from 21 to 52 as well. And the next stage is the time between accessing first, uh, first level facility and the specialized facility. The average is 14, ranging from 9 to 29. And this stage is characterized by the capacity of the first level facilities and also the effectiveness of the referral, referral to the next level. And the last stage is, in, you can see this in blue lines, is the time between accessing the specialized facility and actually TB initiation. The average time is 11, ranges from 6 to 11. And this gives us impression about the capacity of the specialized care. And also this time is affected by the cases of the duplication of functions between first level and second level care. We have uh, found that uh, certain groups are at risk of, the, of experiencing delay in uh, treatment initiation that are people elder than 65 women, urban, urban inhabitants, cases with extra pulmonary TB, HIV positive people, and resistant TB cases. And what is actually raises concerns that 
uh, 19 cases are co-infection and uh, more than a half are resistant TB and a great effort has been put by different stakeholders to influence the situation by this time and still we're, we're seeing a picture like that. Uh, from the interviews, we revealed several barriers for the timely treatment initiation. Uh, this is, uh, uh, first is non-compliance by the first level health care pro providers to national guidelines. Usually they tend to prefer the results of the x-ray over the sputum smear test and they they don't even want to deal with even potential TB cases, so they refer them to specialized care as soon as possible. And also we heard a lot of complaints about the poor laboratory capacities at the first level healthcare. And actually the confliction time schedules and geographically inaccessibility and poor logistics capacity that uh, unreasonably raises the number of visits of the patient with the system, which also demotivates the person, which raises the infectional risk for other people, and which puts a bigger load on the specialized care. And sadly, we still <laughs> see a lot of stigma both, between, both in general population and among health providers as well. So people with TB are still perceived as marginalized groups with risky behavior. And uh, family doctors, they see them as a threat to other patients. And they just want, in, in a lot of cases, to shift their responsibilities to the specialized care. Uh, also, I wanted to raise in this presentation the uh, topic of uh, quality of national data. Introduction in 2012 of the National Electronic TB Registry was a great step forward and this is a very good benchmark for other health areas in Ukraine, but still the quality assurance is an issue to be addressed because in our analysis we could only use only a half of a patient records. Uh, I'm given just a small example that only for 40% of the patient records had the date of the self-reported symptom displays. And in 10 case, in 10%, also this was the same as the date of birth, which also raises questions <laughs> of, its, of the quality of the data. So to sum this up, uh, I wanted to remind that the uh, average time for treatment initiation from accessing the healthcare in Ukraine is 23 days with a big regional variation from 9 to 40 days. And the important areas to address are the referral from first level care to specialized care, the algorithm for extra pulmonary TB and HIV co-infection, and also stigma. Uh, as well as quality assurance of the data has to be addressed as well. Thank you. All right, we have a question. Well, great talk. So my name is Russell Kemker from Atlanta, Georgia. I was interested and concerned about the finding um, longer treatment delay with uh, drug-resistant TB. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had looked at, at those patients, is there any sort of interaction with prior treatment, the treatment in the past, um, and it was that time to any treatment initiation or time to drug-resistant treatment initiation? Uh, thank you for your question. Of course, it was in our first interest, but sadly, because of the quality of data, we couldn't, uh, how to say, just catch all the cases, because when the person is re-registered as a resistant to be, it gets... Uh, it gets an additional case that has to be linked to the first one. Mm -hmm. But when, and they should correspond in numbers. And when we tried to link these cases and we compared the date of birth and gender of person, we only got only around like 14% of, of linkage. Mm -hmm. So sadly we couldn't trace this subpopulation with a good quality, so we decided not to perform the analysis, sadly. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Thank you. 
So our next speaker is uh, Jody Baffa, um, and she'll be talking about um, the effectiveness of IPT um, amongst people living with HIV in KwaZulu Natal. Thank you. So I was looking at isoniazide preventive therapy, um, which also called IPT, which became available community-wide um, for all people living with HIV in 2011 in South Africa. It's offered as a six-month daily tablet regimen to prevent presumed latent TB infection um, from developing into active TB, and it's provided on the basis of a negative symptom screen to rule out uh, active TB disease. So the study took place in Umgunguntlovu district, which is in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, which is the province that reports the highest burden of TB and HIV TB in South Africa. In 2011, the TB notification rate was 1,100 per 100,000 population, and the HIV prevalence is about, is sitting at about 15%. 70% um, of TB cases are co-infected. And in the catchment area we studied, uh, we suspect that all of these figures were quite a bit higher. So this study was part of uh, a larger uh, research project looking at uh, IPT implementation in general, but also looking at IPT acceptability in Zulu communities. So this is just the report on the cohort findings. So the cohort analysis was based on IPT registered data collected from a community health center catchment area. Um, the data was cross-referenced with antiretroviral implementation data collected by a local NGO. Uh, and IPT completers were defined as all people who began IPT between 2011 and 2012 and collected at least five out of six months worth of IPT over the course of eight months. And this was a total of 441 people. These completers were compared to just under 12,000 never users according to IPT registers and ARV registers that dated back to nearly 2000. Outcome was considered any TB confirmed by a smear, gene expert, or culture that developed during the IPT regimen or within 18 months of follow-up using district notification data on both drug, susceptibility, drug susceptible and drug resistant cases. And we also considered ARV use, duration, uh, whether or not the regimen contained tenofovir, uh, CD4 count at ARV initiation, sex, and age in the analysis. So, in terms of findings, um, in the centered bar you can see that the proportion of uptake across the uh, wider catchment area, which included nine clinics, um, differed quite substantially between men and women, despite a relatively equal proportion of male and female TB notifications in 2011, as seen in the leftmost bar. The far right bar shows the proportion of females to males completing IPT among uh, 667 IPT users in the three clinics that made up the community health center catchment area that we did our cohort study in. So in total, there was 65% completion among those who started IPT during 2011 and 2012 at these three clinics. So uh, further to that, um, although there were very few cases of TB that developed among IPT completers, the data show a significant protective effect of IPT even among ARV users. Um, the blue line uh, shows the rate differences between IPT completers and never users, um, and it's stratified here by ARV and by sex. So you can see there's um, appears to be a difference. Uh, uh, appears to be a an additional protection against TB uh, among people using ARVs and a stronger preventive. Um, uh, protective effect in the groups that weren't yet on ARVs. The crude incidence rate ratio was 0.3, so about, uh, so IPT users had a 70% lower rate of TB compared to never users. And then among the ARV naive men, the incidence rate appeared higher um, than other groups with a rate ratio of 0.46 although the precision of the estimate is low just due to the limited sample size. 
In some, these data suggest that six-month IPT provided on the basis of a negative symptom screen provides protection amongst people living with HIV regardless of ARV use in a high burden setting. And also that early, at the early stage of implementation at least, women were more likely to initiate IPT in this setting, which is probably an artifact of the um, just clinic utilization in general. So considering these data, along with ethnographic data on acceptability, we made the following recommendations for future implementation for TB preventive therapy. So strategies for IPT implementation must consider addressing access barriers, particularly for men, but improving patient-centered care for all patients utilizing primary care clinics. A harm reduction approach may encourage people to engage more with health providers and might also improve utilization of clinics, providing more opportunities for IPT initiation. And finally, intermittent regimens such as 12 weekly doses of isoniazide plus rifapentine would help alleviate some of the pill burden and access issues currently experienced, especially by patients living in extreme poverty. So to finish off, I just want to say thank you to the communities, participants, and my advisors with whom I worked, and um, to all members of high TB and TB HIV burden communities. I'd like to say, may you never walk alone. Thank you. Um, any questions for Jody? Jody, can you talk a little bit, you mentioned at the very end about this sort of use of the 12 dose regimen. Um, what, what do you think might it, might it take to sort of implement something like that? So you need, you know, DOT, you need that, obviously that drug supply of the rifapentine. What, what do you think, you know, it's a dream, something that you're recommending, you know, thinking about down the road? Right, um, I think there still need to be probably effectiveness studies done to just make sure it's safe um, to give without, because there's very, at least at this time in the setting, there's very little follow-up um, and very few opportunities to sort of check in with patients to make sure that, you know, hepatotoxicity isn't an issue and, and those types of things. So that would be helpful. But um, I, think, I, I think there's definitely the political will. Um, there definitely needs to be uh, a little more um, training done at, at the primary care site level because there's decentralizations happen so quickly and, and quite effectively, but there's still, it, it means that there's a lot of people in primary care clinics that don't feel very um, confident in, in the treatments that they're providing. So that would need to be ramped up in order for it to, to work properly, I think. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Excellent. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Yared Aswa. Um, he's going to be talking about um, the prevalence and molecular epidemiology of pulmonary TB in the Hawassa Prison Center. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Yared from Ethiopia and uh, currently a PhD uh, student at uh, Adisa University. So I'm uh, presenting you uh, the work that we did on uh, one of the prison centers in Ethiopia. So uh, to begin with, uh, to begin with the burden of uh, TB in Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia ranks tens among the 20, 22 high TB burden countries with the incidence of uh, 207 per 100,000. And as you know, uh, when you see the situation of tuberculosis in uh, prisons, prisons are uh, considered to be a reservoir and a site of TB transmission, including MDR TB. And uh, TB in prisons uh, usually uh, accounts for up to 25% uh, uh, to up to 25% TB burden in some countries. So uh, TB in prison is a challenge for public health uh, system. And just to uh, extend on TB prisons, uh, prison settings are uh, areas where they concentrate and uh, disseminate TB uh, within the prison settings. And they also uh, ex export the TB to the general population so that uh, the problem of uh, uh, tuberculosis in prison is not confined to uh, the prisons, rather it uh, extends beyond uh, the prison walls. 
so that uh, control of uh, uh, TB in prison is uh, an important public health uh, priority. So uh, the rationale of our study is that uh, Ethiopia is the second largest prison in, in Eastern uh, Africa with a population of about 112,000. But there is a limited data on the burden of TB in Ethiopia prisons, and particularly uh, we don't have data on TB burden from Hausa prison of the southern region of Ethiopia. So we are uh, interested just uh, to get the data on this regard. So uh, our study objective is to estimate the prevalence and risk uh, uh, factors associated with TB and uh, MDR-TB in Awasa prison. So uh, the study was conducted at Awasa prison center, which is uh, located in the southern region of Ethiopia, and it is a regional prison center with a capacity of 2,500 inmates, and uh, it has uh, an on site clinic that provides healthcare service for the prison and uh, the prison staff. So, uh, the study was uh, a cross sectional survey that was conducted between June and July of 2015. Uh, we did an active case finding with a CAF screen, and we included all age groups, uh, including gender. So, sputum specimen was collected for the laboratory analysis, and we uh, offered an HIV testing for uh, animates. So this is a study schema that used for the work. So an active case uh, screening was carried out for those who are volunteer and um, uh, eligible for the study. So those who are with calf, of calf screen positives, they submitted uh, two sputums. Uh, spot in the morning, and so this sputum underwent uh, FB microscopy. And then uh, we pulled the samples for the culture, and then a portion of them were uh, for uh, gene expert analysis. So the result shows that uh, we screened about 2,068 uh, prisoners. And of these uh, 369 were found to be a, a positive calf screen. And the majority were, uh, f were male, and they were almost 60% were from uh, urban area, and the median age was about 22, and the, the median prison population per cell was uh, 162. So uh, this table shows uh, the, the laboratory uh, test analysis. So eight were uh, found to be positive by FB microscopy, and 31 were by gene expert. And we also found one case of rifampicin resistance. So uh, the prevalence of screen were uh, found to be 100, uh, 1,499 per 100,000 population. And if you consider the uh, uh, five cases which were already on treatment, the overall prevalence became uh, 1,748, which uh, is about 60. 16 fold than the general population, and it's uh, of course a significant figure in terms of prevalence. So, uh, this table tries to show uh, some of the variables that we analyzed uh, for as a risk factor, and uh, calf duration was uh, found to be uh, statistically significant for the active case uh, for the pulmonary, active pulmonary TB. So uh, we also did an HIV screening, and only nine cases out of 2,400 were found to be positive, and we feel that this is a, a, a low HIV uh, result prevalence. Uh, one case of uh, rifampicin resistance by gene expert was confirmed to be uh, MDR-TB by drug susceptibility testing. And there was no uh, previous MDR TV reports in Ethiopian prison. So uh, this shows uh, the genotyping of uh, the isolates from our culture. And we did RD9 deletion typing, and all the isolate tested were found to be mycobacterium tuberculosis. There was no M bovis or other MTB complex species. So, uh, and as a conclusion, uh, a high prevalence of uh, pulmonary TB was uh, detected in our study, 
And all of the 31 TB cases detected uh, by active case finding had not been you know, uh, recognized through passive case finding, showing the importance of uh, active case finding over uh, passive case finding. Therefore, uh, uh, an active case finding using symptom screen uh, in combination with gene expert has the potential to interrupt the transmission of MTB in correctional facilities in high burden, low and middle income uh, countries. So uh, as a way forward, uh, you know, uh, further work is uh, needed uh, to assess the impact of this active case finding using CAF screen and as an expert to other Ethiopian prisons uh, in order to scale up this uh, intervention throughout uh, the country. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank all these organizations and groups who has, who has contributed a lot for the success of this work. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? I have a question. Um, you know, for the prisoners, the type of prisoners, are they, is it long-term prisoners or are they prisoners that are awaiting trial that might be coming in and out? You know, a lot of the data from South Africa, prisoners and jail, individuals jailed are in the same location. And so there might be someone that gets admitted on a Friday and released the following Friday, but there's also people that are there for years and years. Are, is this a long-term population? Yes, they are, they are a long-term population. And do, and do you have, is treatment available in the, yeah, in the facility? Right. In, the health, in the prison center, there is a clinic that gives service for the prisoners on TB diagnosis and treatment. And then one, one last question. What, how do you deal with infection control once they're identified? Because you identified 30, 31, is that right? 31, yeah. So These cases were uh, reported for the clinic, and uh, they have started or they have started the treatment. Are they put in a different cell or somewhere where they're not sure, transmitting sure, to others? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, when a prisoner is uh, found to be uh, uh, TB positive, they will be isolated in a, in a separate room, okay, and they start the treatment there. Very interesting. No other questions from the audience? Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker is Tom Yates from the UK. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, so I'm presenting this work on um, behalf of myself and also a group from the um, Electronic Health Records um, uh, researchers at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, so I've worked on studies that received support from Sante, GSK and Sanofi. Um, Liam Smith has consulted for GSK and Ian Douglas has consulted for GSK. Gilead has shares in GSK and is funded by GSK. Um, so we, um, the motivation for this work was some, um, uh, basic, a basic science paper by Jan Ribnicker and colleagues. Um, and they found um, that lansoprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor, had activity against um, M tuberculosis, including um, drug-resistant clinical isolates, um, but that omeprazole and pantoprazole had no such activity. Um, they found that lansoprazole was converted in cells to lansoprazole sulfide, and that that inhibits the um, MTB uh, respiratory chain, and the metabolite has no activity against the proton pump. Um, so we decided to look for such activity in a large um, UK um, clinical data set. So UK CPRD contains about 10 million patients registered in primary care clinics. It's um, UK representative, it contains clinical prescribing and demographic data, and it's well validated for a number of diseases. Um, so our idea was that um, PPI users may be less well than the general population, but clinicians generally consider um, PPIs to be interchangeable. So choice of PPI might be affected by meeting with a drug rep or by local policies or by physician preference, but it shouldn't be really associated with um, TB risk factors and that allows a clean comparison. So we performed a multivariable um, Cox proportional hazards um, regression model comparing TB incidents in lansoprazole users versus omeprazole or pantoprazole users. Um, so to be included, you had to be a new user of one of the drugs you had to be an adult and you had to have um, greater than 12 months prior registration uh, in the data set. Um, we excluded people who'd previously used PPIs, people who used um, tacrolimus or cyclosporin because they have an interaction 
with um, omeprazole but not with the other drugs and people with previous TB. Um, so follow-up post-initiation was classified as lansoprazole time or omeprazole or pantoprazole time or time not on either drug um, and the outcome was any clinical or referral record of TB. Um, uh, Martin Borgdorf's work from the Netherlands has shown that TB has an average incubation time of just over a year. So in the primary analysis, we moved all the outcomes 12 months earlier, and then we censored follow-up time um, similarly 12 months earlier, so you didn't have follow-up time where you couldn't have an event. Um, we then uh, had some sensitivity analyses, so we looked at the impact of alternative offsets, so the date as coded in CPRD, um, an offset of two years and an offset of five years. Um, we did an analysis looking at uh, time off PPIs in previous users of lansoprazole versus previous users of omeprazole or pantoprazole. Um, and we also looked at a negative control outcome, which was uh, myocardial infarction. And we plan also to look at um, herpes zoster as a negative control outcome. Um, myocardial infarction is um, well validated in CPID. Uh, we adjusted for a wide uh, range of covariates, so demographic factors, um, ethnicity, um, social risk factors, um, area level multiple um, deprivation score, and several comorbidities. Um, uh, the main reasons for being excluded from the cohorts were um, less than a year of prior registration or previous PPI use, and the final analysis population contained about half a million lansoprazole initiators and just under a million um, pantoprazole or omeprazole um, initiators. Um, these are busy slides, but I've, in red I've highlighted the key differences at baseline. So um, our cohort were in sort of late middle age. Um, uh, there were slightly more smokers in the lansoprazole group. Um, there were some temporal differences in, in prescribing preference. Um, uh, about um, about 60% of the um, population were white, but ethnicity was poorly coded in general. Um, uh, and uh, the group was quite balanced in terms of comorbidities. Um, here's the primary results. So we had about a, about a million um, person years at risk in each group um, under comparison. Um, the rate um, overall compares quite, uh, quite closely to um, uh, UK notification um, data, um, and lansoprazole users had about a third um, less um, TB than, than um, omeprazole or pantoprazole users, and there was little change after adjusting for, for covariance. Um, this is the, s the analysis looking at previous users of omeprazole, pantoprazole or lansoprazole, um, and particularly in the adjusted analysis the effect disappears. Um, the results were robust to using alternative offsets. Um, so in, regardless of the offset um, chosen, the protective effect um, was still there. Um, although uh, applying a, a longer offset reduced the amount of data, so you'll notice the confidence intervals are wider. Um, and uh, our negative control analysis um, showed that there was no association between um, omeprazole or pantoprazole use or, uh, versus lansoprazole use and myocardial infarction. Um, so that, that goes against the um, omeprazole, pantoprazole users being somehow more frail than, than the lansoprazole users. Uh, here we were adjusting for additional risk factors, uh, cardiovascular risk factors. So in conclusion, um, lansoprazole users have about a third less TB um, than users of other PPIs. Um, the uh, Crude point estimate didn't change with adjustment for putative confounders, suggesting that um, a choice of um, PPI probably isn't associated with TB risk factors. Um, uh, so I think this is consistent with um, lansoprazole having a protective effect against TB, um, as suggested by the laboratory science. Um, note there were few HIV positive people in this data set, so caution should be interpreted, uh, exercised in making inference about um, an association in HIV positive people. And given the UK epidemic, if lansoprazole is doing anything, it's probably preventing disease reactivation. Um, 
So to put the results in context, uh, in the Cochrane review, INH reduces TB risk by about 60%, so a, a more dramatic effect than um, the, the effect we um, demonstrated, assuming causality. Um, but we think that higher doses of lansoprazole or, or, or the metabolite could be given. So um, typically, uh, patients in the UK get given 30 milligrams once a day, and Jan Ribnicka gave his mice up to 300 milligrams per kilogram of lansoprazole. Um, we think it's an attractive um, potential agent for use against TB because it's, it's widely used. We have extensive experience using the drug. Um, it has a very favourable side effect profile and it's off patent. And we think that dose finding studies and maybe uh, RCTs in the future are warranted. That's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Any questions from the audience? I had a question. Did you look at all of the geographic, is, is the prescribing patterns different throughout the country and will that have an effect and, and the incident rate of TB, does it vary tremendously across the different areas of the country? So we've not done an analysis adjusted by area, but we've, um, in a sensitivity analysis, which I've not presented here, um, we adjusted by the proportion of people in each practice on, on lansoprazole versus the other drugs. So we think that should deal with spatial confounding. Great. Yeah, very, very nice. Uh, talk um, and yeah very interesting um, so um, yeah do, so the basically it was older people um, so how, which would fit probably with your idea this is blocks reactivation because that's the type of population that you would maybe expect more reactivation in perhaps but how does it fit with the uh, the age distribution of tuberculosis cases within uh, um, uh, the UK I mean is that the same mean age for, uh, or median age for TB people in the UK? Um, so, to guess, I think our cohort's probably, probably a little bit older. Um, the, we look for an interaction between age and the hazard ratio of, uh, the, the, and protective effect, and uh, the pattern was, wasn't really, there wasn't a, cl a clear trend in either direction, so the, 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 the effects seem to be there in both older and younger. Um, individuals in our cohort, but um, and so the use of lan lansoprazole is would be more in older patients than younger patients in in general, would it? Just yeah, just uh, and more in sicker patients, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very nice. Thanks. Great. Fantastic. Thank you.